You became a best-selling author overnight with Straight Talking, but it was really the now iconic Jemima J, a a novel about swans and ugly ducklings that made you an overnight superstar. Take viewers back to the original inspiration for that wonderful book. The truth is, Jemima J, I was never 100 pounds overweight, but I was, I was an overweight kid, and I was a kid who, who was chubby, but was constantly put on diets and told that I, I was, you know, that I had to lose weight and I, I had to, um, I was not good enough. And so, and actually, you know, Jemima's story was really my story um, and really how, how I felt. I think, I also think that Jemima as a character had, had a sweetness that was really relatable. Um, she was just a good person and, and she wanted just a very si simple life and wanted to be seen. Um, and I think just so many women related to that and young women. And I, I still get letters from 12 year old girls, you know, young teens and preteens because we, so many of us feel that we're just not enough. And that's really what, what Jemima is about. It's about a woman who doesn't feel enough, who then realizes that it's okay to not be enough. You can still go for the things that you want. Jemima is a really common name in the UK. It, um, um, so I know here, people think of Aunt Jemima Pancakes, but actually Jemima is one of those very traditional English names. Um, and actually my, um, my working title for the book was always Jemima Jones. And then I remember my editor saying, well, we can't call it Jemima Jones because Bridget Jones's diary has just come out. So Straight Talking was the first book I wrote, which was a big bestseller in the UK. But the book, but the book that was really huge was my second book was the first book to be published here, which was Jemima J. Um, and Jemima J was the Cinderella story updated. And, and it was, I, I went to LA to write it. I had the best time. I remember the, the very first thing that, it, that inspired it was, um, was my roommate. Um, I, I was working for a TV company at the time um, and I was living in, in Manchester and I had this roommate and she was very, very small very, very wide. And, and she actually was, was, I mean, she clearly had struggles with food. You know, we'd find food wrappers everywhere. And, and, but she was also incredibly self-possessed. And actually the very beginnings of Jemima J was, I wanted to write about her. I mean, I wanted to write about a woman like her. Um, but in fact, and this is what so often happens, you, you start writing thinking, thinking that a character is going a certain way and, and almost immediately, it becomes a completely different character. That's what happens. So Jemima was supposed to be this, this you know, self-possessed, sexy, overweight woman. But actually, she became this, this kind of, uh, the invisible, she became what I was as a child. She became an invisible woman. Um, and she, who felt that nobody could see past her, her excess weight to see who she was and the beauty that, that lay within. And then of course she goes through this whole Cinderella transformation, ugly duckling into a swan, but a swan who she just transfers one eating disorder, overeating to the opposite to kind of, you know, anorexia and, and sort of learns that actually the way to happiness is obviously is balance. Um, but that book was an enormous bestseller here. How did it feel when you walked into a bookstore, either in Britain or in the U.S., to see your book for sale on shelves? That's such a special moment for any author. Yeah, that was amazing. But um, with my very first books, with Straight Talking, there was a lot of press around the book. And, and that, so I'd been on the other side. I was always the journalist. And all of a sudden, I was being interviewed. And, and I remember feeling very exposed and very vulnerable. And I, I remember doing um, the Daily Mail did a big piece and I remember they they wanted a photograph of me lying on a chaise in a red evening dress surrounded by a bunch of, of male models in in black tie feeding me grapes and champagne and it was the cheesiest thing I had ever heard in my life and I remember being horrified by the prospect and saying I'm, I, I can't do that and them saying well if you don't do that we won't run the piece and I remember thinking Oh, well, I have to. So I was sort of, I felt like I was forced into doing this, this awful photo shoot where I just felt, I just, I felt really uncomfortable. And that was a really good lesson because now I say no, if I'm not comfortable, I, nothing is worth, you know, 
your discomfort in that in that way or and also how you i mean i i'm very one of the great joys of of being this age and still writing is that i really know who i am now i didn't know who i was earlier i was trying to be someone else i think my writing was always has always been authentic because that's actually how i've how I express myself um, but now I'm able to bring that authenticity to everything like who you see is this is me I'm, I'm not being anyone else I'm, I'm very honest I'm very down to earth um, and and I, I like that I'm, I'm leading a really authentic life now and so um, yeah I'm never going to be coerced into doing a, a photo shoot in an evening gown again <laughs> Once you became a best-selling author, did it take long for you to adjust to the inevitable public side of that fame? I think for a long time, I didn't know how to be a best-selling author. I kind of felt like, oh, I'm now a best-selling author. I have to look a certain way. I have to act a certain way. I remember thinking very clearly, I need to move to America with this book because if America's going to make a commitment to me, I have to make a commitment to America. And I moved here to ride that wave. And, and I did ride that wave for a very long time. What my advice, I mean, it, look, I don't regret it, of course not, but it's almost, it's impossible to live up to that kind of success when out the gate. You kind of think when you're young, I mean, I was 20, I don't know, 27, you think, oh, this is just the beginning. I'm going to be earning more and more and I'm going to be, this is only, this. I just, it never occurred to me that, at some point, my, my numbers would drop or my career would struggle. Um, so I think my, the, my best advice is always to people who have huge success early on, put your money away. You have not won the lottery. Do not do what I did and spend it. That's amazing advice and so true. Still, that book really did change the way people talked about body image issues and really felt about it after reading it and really for the first time. When you were following that book up, what kind of pressure were you feeling? Uh, the first thing, the the eating disorder and overweight women, you know, Jemima inspired a very strong reaction in people. So whilst there there were millions of women who love that book and who write to me still today to say that book was the book that changed their lives, there are there were many women who absolutely hated it because they didn't understand the me the message was never you have to be thin, the message was was you have to be happy with yourself. It doesn't actually matter what weight you are, but but it was it was misinterpreted, I think, by a lot of women. And there are women who to this day hate that book. There are also women who for whom it, you know life has changed. That was the beginning of a of a few tumultuous years where it was the first time I had different titles in the UK and in the US. And it led to them thinking it was okay to have different titles going forward. But of course, the internet made that impossible. I still, in fact, I had an angry letter from somebody this week who had bought, um, well, which one had she bought? She bought Dune Road and then she, and then she it had another title in the UK. I can't remember what it was called in the UK, but she realized that it was um, the same book that she'd already read it. And she felt that often people feel like I'm trying to pull one over on them. I'm deliberately putting out books with different titles because I'm trying to get people to spend money twice. Um, anyway, um, so actually what happened with that was I called the book Life Swap. And I was in a meeting with, um, I think it was Simon and Schuster who I was talking to at the time. And the guy said, hey, did you ever read that book? Because uh, I was describing the book and it was called Life Swap. And he said, hey, did you ever read that book, Life Swap? I went, what book, Life Swap? He said, oh, there was a book written in the 70s about a woman in New York who actually did this. She, she swapped lives with someone, um, but like with husbands and boyfriends and like everything. They literally just sort of swapped. And she wrote a memoir about it. And so I found this book, I tracked this book down and I got it and I started to read it. And, and it, it was, t I mean, mine was fiction. It was totally different. Um, but I had the book on my bookshelf. And when the book was, I guess, coming out and I'd given an interview and they photographed me with my bookshelves behind me and the author of that book, who had never written anything subsequent to that, then trademarked the title series 
and, and issued a cease and desist. And, and they said, well, look, we think that you would win, but is it a fight you want to have? And we just decided it's just not worth the fight. And so we changed the title here to Swapping Lives.